CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host, Jonah Bronstein, he of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, with us for this episode, it is Jerry Sullivan from Channel 4 and the Niagara Gazette. Um, we were just having a discussion that I want to uh, put out there uh, for everyone to, to uh, comment on. Not what you're thinking. We'll get to that eventually. But uh, Jonah Bronstein uh, brought it up that two of the three of us are wearing fanboy apparel, me with my Cleveland Indians hat circa 1979. Uh, and Jerry Sullivan is wearing a Ted Williams jersey. Uh, and Jonah thinks we look like a couple of fanboys. I think that's the aesthetic. I don't know if I necessarily call you guys that to your face if we weren't across a zoom keyboard here but that's the look if people don't know any better and also maybe if people know where you guys were born and grew up and the teams that they think you might be biased towards jerry it's your thoughts like, on grown men wearing jerseys i i think they're idiots and and but here i am a hypocrite right off the bat <laughs> it's the only jersey i own my son gave it to me for my birthday once and i break it out once in a while i i wouldn't wear it out in public because you go to a football game and there's millions of these jerseys. I, it just creeps me out. Women wearing them is even worse. It's just, it, I just don't like it. I don't think adults should, should wear them. Now, a T-shirt is different. Bucky and I had a big argument once on my, our old radio show. Now, a T-shirt, I showed up in like a Matsuzaka, just a T-shirt. And he goes, well, that's a jersey because it had a number. No, it's not a jersey. It's a jersey if it's a jersey, right? But that's another question. Where do you draw the line? The name on the back? Is that where it gets out of line for you? No, no. Because that's a T-shirt. The buttons? A button-down button jersey with, you know, n n names, numbers on there that people would wear in a game is a jersey. They don't wear T-shirts, although, I don't know, maybe the White Sox that time when they had shorts is a difference. I think wearing jerseys to a game is probably the worst offense because it's like cosplaying. Do you think they're going to call you out of the stands and they need somebody who has the proper attire to play in the game or you want to – look like the players that you're rooting for. So that's why you dress just like them. There is a cosplay element to it. Uh, if you make fun of people for dressing up like Star Wars characters when they go to the latest uh, premiere, uh, then you, you probably shouldn't be a big jersey wearer. Uh, I will agree that there's an element of that. Although, if, I don't know, if you're going to wear a jersey around, I mean, isn't that where you would wear it? That's where most people do wear their jerseys and why they even purchase the jerseys in the first place. If I had place. an Anakin Skywalker costume in my closet, I, uh, I probably wouldn't wear it out uh, to Wegmans. I would wear it to the premiere if I had one. Yeah. But, I mean, so, I Jerry, I want to follow up with one of the things you said there. You said you wouldn't wear that jersey out in public. Putting a jersey on to walk around the house, isn't that – I mean, they're, they're heavy a little bit. Uh, they I mean, I, are they necessarily comfortable? Can you hear my TV in the background, by the way? No, I was just going to ask if you can hear my dog who uh, okay. is, no, no, wants I mean, to play. I just put it on for the show. That's really all I did, just to have something to represent and be funny, you know, because I'm a funny guy. But when it comes to the thing with the jerseys, people that wear them at the games, adults, males, they're part of the tribe. You know, they want to be part of the team. They, just, they say we, you know, it's like, and I'm not a fan. And I'm not, I, and this could probably lead into some of the discussion we're going to have today about sports journalism, whatever there is of it that still exists versus fans and how the media is being kind of compromised. Uh, but I, I just object to a lot to fan stuff. I, I, 
I, I grew up a Red Sox fan, but I really don't root for them anymore. I don't. I rooted against them a lot of times because I picked against them. It's about me, really. Let's get the all the jersey discussion out before we change the subject. Jonah, you had a point regarding NBA jerseys. I'm going to go turn my TV down. I, I mean, I like – I'll be right back. Uh, the aesthetic, the fashion, uh, that some people wear basketball jerseys, throwback basketball jerseys especially since I, you know, I go to, you know, summer basketball type events or you could just see people, Tyler Dunn, remember he had his bachelor party and we all had to buy a basketball Jersey to wear to that thing. And that's one of the two that I own is the Moses Malone Jersey I bought for that, but I don't wear them a lot. And sometimes I am conscious of not trying to look like a person that wears jerseys because when then you go try to cover local teams, you don't want to be known as the, uh, you know, the jerk that wears jerseys. Jerry has now removed his uh, right. Ted Williams jersey for those who aren't watching on YouTube. And what, and what is that underneath? It's bas something basketball, right? Yeah, I think this is a good one. This has a history to it. This is personal to me. Uh, it's a Jeremy Lin t-shirt. It was purchased for me in New York by a friend named Mark Hamister when I was getting my hip replaced. I got my hip replaced almost exactly during the Lin, Lin sanity. I think the, the game he had against the Lakers, I think, was two days before I got the hip cut um so this is it's meaningful to me mark hamister the former buffalo destroyers owner um rick hamister oh Sorry. rick hamister rick is cousin and but mark is no longer with us in fact i wanted to say and jonah you'd agree larry reagan uh died recently great ub fan son of uh, father of will and the olympic uh emily the olympic rower and, and as well as mark pike today tim i Mark was one of my favorite Bills. I did a column on him at the Super Bowl once. He had more special teams tackles than Tasker, and uh, he died at 57 of them in or So uh, tough RIP to both those good men. Uh, Larry Reagan the was a, what, just a good basketball player at St. Lawrence College. Yes. Or I think it's the university, early 80s, late 70s. Well, what do you remember of Mark Pike? Of, of covering him, Jerry? I remember he was just quiet, and I didn't talk to him. I, I never had interviewed him, believe it or not, and until the Super Bowl, the last one, and I was looking for a, a, a store column, and he and I sat alone at a table. Steve Tasker was two tables over with two dozen people because he was Steve Tasker, and Mark loved being interviewed. But he was only, it wasn't bitter, but he was, he, it was clear that he felt overlooked. He had more tackles than Tasker. He was a great special teams player. You know, Marv Levy allowed them both to be on the team for a long time, Mark Pike played 173 games for the Bills, the same number as Thurman Thomas. It's ninth or 10th all time. He was a fixture. Those days have obviously gone when you could just be a special teams guy, and he was the backup to Bruce Smith. But you would, all, you would often see him out there just making one of those solid tackles when they had great special teams under Bruce DeHaven, who adored him, by the way, and the late Bruce DeHaven. And Tasker was great, obviously. People want to put him in the Hall of Fame. He made big plays. And he joked at the end of that story, he said maybe at a Super Bowl someday he could jar a ball loose in a big situation, force a fumble, and the end of the story was, of course, Steve would run it in for a touchdown. <laughs> now, one more memory, Phil Hansen's retirement, probably my favorite one. I don't know if you were around. He, whatever, that would have been 01, 02. And he was very emotional, gave a speech, and it was mainly about the guys who worked there, like Woody and all, all the, the, the little people. People that, He talked about going to the store, the type of stuff Josh Allen is good at, but Phil, Phil Hansen was really great talking about the community. One player came from out of town, Mark Pike, drove from Kentucky to be there for Phil Hansen. That is pretty cool. You know, Jerry, these are the moments where I think your voice is uh, really missed. Uh, there, the lack of institutional knowledge on the bills is uh, glaring in this market. Uh, you've a couple of times in this conversation have referenced whether or not I was there uh, or, you know, you mentioned Mark Pike uh, to me. I never covered Mark Pike, but in fact, I didn't start covering the Bills until I joined ESPN in 2008. That's 13 years ago. And I think a lot of people view me as an old hand uh, as covering this team. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, we've discussed this uh, on this podcast before regarding how things happened at the Buffalo News, but I mean, your voice on people like Mark Pike, I think, uh, is is sorely missed. And I hope that uh, you consider writing a column about him for either uh, WIVB or, or uh, the Niagara Gazette. But 
Um, anyways. Um, yeah, I'm the old guy. As I, in my day, <laughs> I think I let that slip out the other day in a moment of uh, <clears throat> uh, an emotional moment. But um, yeah, and last year, you know, I, don't, I didn't just always rip the bills. I wrote a lot of long features, went to their houses and talked to them. Last year, for four consecutive days before the title game, I wrote one story about all four title games, interviewing all these former bills. Mark Pike might even been one of them. And it was, I had a great time with that. But sometimes I'm thinking though, well, you don't want to be that guy. I never wanted to be the old timer who talked about guys from 40 years ago. But in that case, you talk about institutional knowledge. Yeah, the Buffalo News is really hurting by a lot. Not just the Buffalo News, all of us, all all, all the outlets. Yeah, well, they are the newspaper, but but yeah, there is. I mean, well, you talk about 23 year old, you know, TV announcers. They they don't even remember Ryan Fitzpatrick. But I, that's important, I think, to some people, to people that have a historical perspective and like reading those things. And then other people just feel like you're lost in the past. But uh, I can talk about the modern guys too, that don't cover the team full time anymore. And Tim mentioned missing your voice. I think that's important to emphasize because you don't have a radio show or a regular podcast anymore to talk about some of these subjects and and then a week where some people weren't happy to hear your voice again <laughs> yeah the, i guess my voice was out there and it, i shouldn't be surprised any longer but that that was a big deal does kind of you know confound me like all i did was ask a question that would would have been asked in times past and not caused a big to do are you embarrassed in what was one of the more embarrassing games in the history of the Buffalo Bills and the league, I think. I mean, the, the whole context of Bill Belichick and all, it was an embarrassment. People left that place feeling embarrassed for the Bills. I had people look, saying they don't want to follow the team anymore. So here's the guys on the field. You know, I'm supposed to show respect by not asking that question. It's not my job to respect them. That's the other thing, though. There's not any, enough columnists anymore whose job, I always thought it was my job to provoke. You don't intentionally want to upset people, but but I've provoked a lot of people in my time, much bigger people than Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer. And I thought that was my job. And often you're the only guy in the room that'll do it. I was the only guy in, the, in a room of 100 people that challenged Bobby Knight once. He told me I didn't know my ass from third base and 27 guys use it as their lead. So it's sometimes it helps the group. I was the only one at the Masters in 03 during the Martha, what's her name, uh, thing about women not being at Augusta, who, who challenged Tiger Woods on it. It didn't seem like a real out there thing to challenge Tiger Woods, who came into the league, uh, went onto the tour with his father, comparing to Jesus Christ and saying he was going to unite the races. And he wouldn't say boo about women not being able to play in certain clubs. And I challenged him on it. I guess I was a bad guy. I went to the Super Bowl after, after Cam Newton a week earlier had said, wait, I'm judged as a black quarterback. A pretty po- a powerful statement. I asked him about it in a press conference. You would have thought I pulled my pants down in front of the room and moon, mooned him. It was a legitimate question. And it's getting worse and worse. No one wants to ask the tough question. So you got me going. Is that, was that your purpose here? Well, Jonah's the one that brought it up. I, I wasn't even going to mention I it, Jerry. I thought we were just going to talk about jerseys the entire time. <laughs> Show uh, some respect. I'll, I'll show re- you. I'll, I will remember that, Jonah. I'll remember that question. <laughs> oh, I got right. plenty. With, I feel like this is important that we put Jerry in the position and asking him tough, difficult, provoking <laughs> questions so he can yeah, have wow. some empathy for the players that he, he puts <laughs> in that position. Well, Jerry, you said earlier that you put on your Ted Williams jersey for the show. Uh, there are a lot of people who think you were asking that question for a show. Um, and I know you long enough. I think that there is a fine line between provoking and uh, grandstanding. Uh, I don't think you were grandstanding, uh, but let me, I guess, let me lay out my thoughts and then, and then you, we can discuss. Sure. Um, number one, technically, I thought, technically, I thought it was a bad question because it was a yes or no. Mm-hmm. That's, right. that's, my, that's my quibble. Uh, the other point I want to make is that the word embarrassed or embarrass or embarrassingly, some form of that word has been asked a dozen times in Bill's news conferences all year. Now, they've politely answered those questions. Sean McDermott was asked that question uh, a few minutes after uh, uh, Jordan Pryor oh, yeah. and Micah Hyde were asked, yeah, you asked it, and he answered it. Josh Allen has answered that question. 
These guys, have, you go back to um, the opener, Cole Beasley talked about it being an embarrassment to lose to the Steelers. So this is something that's happened, but in this moment on national TV, when ESPN on its flagship highlight show, the Scott Van Pelt show, is showing these clips virtually live, just with a little bit of a delay, um, after a tough loss in which they just got their ass handed to them, you have two proud players who are going to walk into a room and say, well, I'm not going to let these guys hand my ass to me after I just had Belichick hand my ass to me. So they're feisty. So it was a, it was a mix. I mean, and it was, a, it was a pretty strong mix. But anyway, I guess I'm getting away from my point is that people who haven't listened to all the news conferences all year would know that this question has been asked after they lose, especially after Jacksonville, especially after not being able to string two win wins together. They've been asked about this a lot, and they've answered it politely. This is the first time that anybody's ever pushed back. And, and I know I'm overloading here by throwing a lot of stuff out there. I want to make a point that gets overlooked uh, uh, in, in people talking about this. The first question of that news conference was asked by Adam Benini from Channel 2. And Mike Hyde snapped on him. And the question was about how bad the running uh, defense was, to which Mike Hyde said, didn't you ask me about that last week? Well, this isn't, a, <coughs> this isn't a suicide pool where we're only allowed to ask, <coughs> ask a question once and then it's off the table for the rest of the season. So um, <coughs> I think as I'm COVIDing here, yeah. Um, it's, yeah, uh, you make a good go point. It, 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 and I wrote this in my column that I was following up on Adam Benini. And I've tried to do that over the years. And I don't think enough news journalists do it enough is back each other up and follow up on questions and put press these people. We're, we're supposed to have the power there. There's more of us. And if we're trying to get answers and someone pulls that, he's obviously a little touchy. And, and oh, you already asked that question. Well, you just get your ass kicked again. And now he's asking it again. And that's kind of why I jumped in there. And I'm not grandstanding. I was defending him. But if it comes off as grandstanding with me, fine. But I don't need to grandstand. I don't even need to be there. If anything, I'm a little uneasy being there like only once, eight times a year. And I try to hold back uh, and let other people ask their questions who are like full time. But I waited for several minutes after um, one of those games. And, and no one pointedly asked about COVID. Two of their toughest linemen are out because they're not va vaccinated. And I pointedly asked McDermott if it's especially disappointing. And he answered, and he said he doesn't want to talk about who's not here. But how can that question not not be asked? And it was I, Matt, I, I think it was Matt Perino. Said, have they used the word embarrassing in those questions several times this year? Or have they minced around it? Like That's the way I remember it. And I could have to go back and listen, but that's the way I remember it. Because I think there were a number of times when I thought, ooh, that's a tough question. Let's see how they handle this. Um, Matt Perino, after the Colts game, asked Josh Allen, what would he say to people who think they're frauds? Right. I remember uh, that. So, I mean, these and, and Josh Allen handled it. Definitely. He didn't get upset. He, and he answered the question in, in a meaningful way. Um, Josh Allen's getting very good, by the way. I, I've, I was a little suspicious uh, early in his career, how much of how just that if, if he was polished, but he's gotten to be a pretty good communicator and a leader on that team. But anyway, I, I agree with that. Uh, it was an unusual situation. As, I mean, being one of the more embarrassing games ever, maybe, lifted above those those others and that that's why it happened I, th I think Hyde was just you know go watch the film I saw a four minute piece on ESPN today where they just laid out how they got you know schooled uh in the run game and Micah Hyde's back there missing tackles he had a bad game I don't I don't mind that I know that we get them always have gotten them when when their emotions are high that's why they have the 10 minute rule and sometimes you're going to get under their skin fine but don't don't do what he did. He says, don't ask that question. Show respect. Respect Respect for what? What do you mean respect? And I will remember that. It was like some thug out there. Oh, wow. Maybe he's going to beat me up outside. Show respect because he comes out once a week and, and mouths platitudes. One of the problems is we don't go in the locker room. They don't go in the locker room anymore. The whole situation is toxic, I think, because maybe toxic is the wrong word. It's just, it's vanilla. No one can go in and make, I've had some guys on the beat say, you can't, can't form relationships anymore. You can't teach them 
Um, you can't, um, you know, get them aside and, and talk to them off the record and do all that stuff that reporters always did. They have everything under control now. And you go out twice a week and someone asks you're embarrassed and that's an affront to a professional athlete. I'm sorry. I wish Larry Felser was here to, to talk about this. I mean, it's maybe I sound like the old guy then. That Anyway, move on. Any, uh, would you do it any differently, Jerry? Right now. What? Would you do it any differently? Do what? Monday night, your question. If you, I mean, I know that, and there's plus, there's also in a, in a news conference, you're not called upon, there's no order, um, which has its benefits, but you need to blurt a question out to get, to get heard. And it just, it sometimes comes off as confrontational when really you're just trying to get your question asked. Yeah. I, I don't know what I would do in the situation. Again, I might not even have asked it, although I wanted the, to, them to talk about a historic defensive performance where a guy attempted three passes. And then when he, when he snapped at Benini, you know, I wanted to push him a little bit. I, I, would I, you say it was a yes or no. And I know those are bad. What's, what's a better way to ask if you're embarrassed to say, well, people are saying you're embarrassed or people are saying you're a fraud, whatever. I could have said, oh. I did kind of in the question say people out there, I did say people out there are going to be calling you soft. There's another one at, after the indie game. The word soft didn't come up, but that's basically what people are saying. Um, you know, if you want some questions to be phrased a little differently, it'd be more diplomatic. But what's what's always been a problem for me is the mincing around, as I call it. You know, when these people who I won't name any names, they ask a question. It's like, you know what they really want to say, but they don't want to offend them. They don't want to be the bad guy. They don't they don't want to embarrass themselves and they don't use they're not direct. I believe in direct questioning especially now when you get so few opportunities i'm glad i'm not on the beat so i'd be frustrated i'd probably be causing more problems because it's not a good situation it's not real journalism and we're in a town where people cheerlead for the team a lot of media cheerlead for the team and it's hard to be a real journalist i think uh, there are um, trigger words that you have to be really careful with and i think embarrassing is one of them quit tank soft fraud you know things like that um and i think that you need to be a little more artful with the question if you're going to use that word i i think personally the way i would have asked it i wouldn't have used the word embarrassing and maybe that would have been um maybe you disagree with that but i, I would say how does it sit with you that and i'd give a you know hot that this happened give a couple of stats um kind of you know but that 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 allows the me as the questioner to remain neutral and say, okay, you tell me how you feel rather than giving you this word that puts you in a corner. Uh, but like I said, um, guys have been handling these questions like this all year. And I do think it was a glimpse and there was value in, in the response. Um, some people may feel it was uh, brought about, you know, not in the best way, but it did, it showed a glimpse of the team. You know, they were, they were prickly from the moment they sat down. You hadn't even spoken yet. And they were, they were snapping on, on uh, legitimate questions about the run defense. Yeah, I don't, I don't, the, the home games I've been to, I haven't found like a hide to be any, you know, Socratic orator, you know, I, I, and after losses, I think he and Poyer kind of, as I use the word, they're a little bit sneering up there. I don't think, uh, you know, he can talk about coming out and answering questions and respecting us and all that stuff he's saying. I will say, and I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to him because we just don't get that chance, but I made a joke after uh, they posted the back-to-back -back shutouts against uh, Washington and Houston. Um, I said, how come you guys can't score touchdowns? Uh, I was talking to Micah Hyde, you know, as a safety. I was, because it was two back-to-back -back awesome efforts. And down in, so they score a touchdown the next game at Kansas City, and I'm off to the side there. And Micah Hyde sits down and looks at Sal Mayorana and was like, are, are you the guy that said we, we, you know, but we couldn't score touchdowns, which wasn't what I asked. And then Sal's like, no, it was him. Cause we're all wearing masks and stuff too, which is probably another thing that, that draws their ire is that they're standing up there in front of the lights and we're hiding behind our masks. And, and it's, I guess, legitimate. It just adds to that. You use the word toxic, toxic. And I think it is a little toxic of we're up here. You're down there. We can't even see your face. All we see are your eyes and, you can, you can scurry off and, and write what you want to write after a tough loss. But anyway, uh, he looked at me, Micah Hyde did, after Sal Mayorana corrected him and looked at me and said, that one was for you. And I don't think he was joking. 
I, I laughed about it, but, uh, and we laughed about it in the elevator going back up to the, to the press box, but I don't think he was joking. I was like, you guys just had back to back shutouts and I was cracking a joke. Uh, and then you just won the game of the season at, at that point. And, and that was the first thing he wanted to say. So these guys do, I mean, that's how you get to the NFL. It's how you get to the top of your sport is sometimes with a chip on your shoulder, but um, it's uh, interesting. Jonah, anything else on this topic? Well, I think that and what happened Monday night shows a little bit of a misunderstanding, misperception of, you know, how the whole dynamic works with the media, the athletes and the audience is that, you know, the athletes shouldn't be up there trying to literally answer our questions like we're prosecutors and feel like, you know, whether we're asking totally fair questions or whatnot and having to respond specifically to our thoughts and feelings. These are really just prompts to get them to talk about the game, talk about their performance, talk about the teammates, the opponent, et cetera, to give the fans and the media what they want. That's part of the experience of watching uh, spectator sports to get reactions from the participants and the people that were out there performing and also to inform the stories and the coverage that we give an athlete, you know, doesn't really have to answer the question that's asked. They can take it in whatever direction they want, deflect, Oftentimes they refuse to answer or no comment and they can react angrily in the way that Micah Hyde did. Uh, you know, I, I want to, I was going to say that's perfectly acceptable. Maybe it's not perfectly acceptable, but that's a response that you see from athletes very often. But what it does is it shows a sensitivity and a, you know, as Jerry wrote in his column for the Gazette, they acted like they were embarrassed being asked that question. So it kind of answered the question in and of itself. And if they had just said, if, and Jordan Poyer kind of did say this after his initial objections, that no, they're not embarrassed because they thought on the whole the, the defense did its job or, or did somewhat of its job in limiting the certain amount of yards and points. And I think there's an argument to be made. I think that's what Poyer and Hyde were maybe trying to say after the Colts game, that on balance through the whole season, the run defense actually has been good more often than it's been bad. But, you know, the athlete, the, the, the wise, the media savvy athlete, is always in control of what they say, how they answer questions, and what topics. That's what Bill Belichick does better than anything. You're never going to get him to give an answer that he doesn't want to give. And we don't, in the media, don't like the way he answers questions. But if Bill Belichick was embarrassed after a game, I don't think he would ever respond to a question about embarrassment in that way. And who decides who goes out and talks? I don't know, really, who who the representative is of the football writers, but I'd and again, I don't, I'm not there, so I shouldn't really speak on it, but when is someone going to complain about McDermott showing up like 40 minutes after the players sometimes and making people wait, especially on a Monday night? I don't know what he's doing. I mean, his time is so much more important than everyone else's. And who decides that certain nominated leaders are always out there? Why is it always po Poyer and Hyde? Maybe the organization should take some of the heat for throwing them out there every time. You don't think they are back there going, why can't Jerry Hughes be sent out there once in a while? Or Star, or, or you know, Star's not vaccinated, so I guess he's not going out there. But, you know, who, who, why, doesn't, why don't the writers say, um, we want different people once in a while? Especially in the old days when you would go in the locker room and they were obligated, every guy to be available once a week or twice a week. You can tell me when I'm wrong. Now, there's, what are the obligations now? And why doesn't someone speak up and say, why has Jerry Hughes not addressed us once all year? Can we we didn't him? hear from Tredavious White, all pro cornerback all season um, before he got hurt. And uh, and said, it's really, except for a statement. So uh, the rules are, now I know things have changed with COVID, but the rules in general are everybody must be made available, um, you know, by request or whatever. And again, this is pre-COVID. You would have, uh, you would be able to go in the locker room. Everybody was available uh, after every practice uh, or game with the exception of two people who were allowed to speak once a week. And that's usually, you know, the quarterback. That wasn't the case with Ryan Fitzpatrick, who was available every day. But a team can designate two guys, and it's usually – the quarterback and your star defensive player. When I was in Miami, it was the quarterback and Jason Taylor um, in, you know, different places. Now, some, some teams who have a lot of superstars on their roster, like the Patriots or the Jets back under Rex Ryan, when they had a lot of, they were collecting guys, um, there would be, they would try to stretch that, but that's the rule. So everybody's supposed to be available 
by request. Um, I don't know who's being requested. If anybody, uh, we do put in some requests after the games. Uh, I don't necessarily care because I do not really operate off of news conferences much. Uh, I don't like to ask questions at news conferences because I don't want everybody to know what I'm working on. A lot of times when I ask a question at a news conference, it has nothing to do with what I'm writing about. Um, it's because I'm genuinely curious um, and I don't have an opportunity to talk to pick up a phone and, and ask Sean McDermott a question on Tuesday morning. So I'll ask him in the news conference. Um, and sometimes just to throw so, people I, off from what I'm working on. But, um, but yeah, where are these other guys? Why the, the Jerry, uh, Jerry Hughes, like you say, is supposed, he's the longest tenured bill. Um, where has been what, wh and it's always good players. The people you want to talk to after a game, a lot of times are the ones, especially after a loss are the ones that need to be asked what happened on a certain play. Isaiah McKenzie, after he fumbled the right. punt, uh, Daryl Williams, when he's playing right tackle, uh, Devin Singletary or Zach Moss after a particularly rough game running the ball. What do you see? Why are you having trouble getting going? Um, you know, there's a ton of guys. Stefan Diggs doesn't talk uh, during uh, or after games, uh, even though that and that is a, a player who does well, but doesn't uh, is is kind of shielded after the game. So if I'm Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer, I'm a human being and I got to be sick of being the one to go out there and answer questions every week, even though I think they, they do enjoy it. I think they, they take it as a, a obligation as a leader on the team, all that type of stuff. Uh, so, but it has to wear thin for these guys to be the ones every freaking week to have to go out there, uh, especially after losses and, and face the, you know, face the firing squad. It must carry. We're thin with the media too. And yeah, if you want to talk to Isaiah McKenzie and pull him aside and go off the record about what's happened to him, you can't do that, right? I remember in the old days, so Mario, Mario Williams would never would never come out. I mean, they used to break the rules in the old days, whatever. And I, I, I was with you at times. Like I was a columnist. I didn't really need the stuff. And most of them have, have nothing to say. That's why it's even more important if you want to get good stuff. Is And the reporters, they're really being compromised here. And they're not able to develop sources and i and the league loves that we're never going back i don't think do you jonah pro sports yeah i think there'll be an element of locker room coverage but it'll be more restricted and the lines can be redrawn in ways that you know favor the league and the players and not the media but i don't think the current bringing everybody out to the podium and never opening up the locker room after games in all sports will continue like baseball they they had not post-game clubhouse access, but batting practice access, they brought that back. So you're seeing different ways that the access is being brought back when safety is not an issue. Well, Generally, you don't get things back once they're taken away. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. I don't know that there's been a threat of another shoe bomb uh, for many, many years, but we still have to take our shoes off when we well, go through right. security but at TSA. It wasn't taken away like it's a freedom of the press in the – leagues didn't want that it was taken away because of safety concerns with the virus i think if that ever goes same away, thing with shoes it's like hey away. it's just just for now just until we get through this and then after a while the things I mean, become I, permanent yeah but that's not i don't think that's a uh, an accurate comparison because because I, and the locker rooms and the access wasn't given in the first place as favors to us necessarily it was part of being transparent and encouraging access and media coverage that benefits the league as a whole. Now they will probably redraw the lines and what type of access is allowed and what type of access is not allowed, but I don't see it as like, you know, pro sports were a government that was trying to be more authoritarian. And now they're going to use this as a way to extend their control over the media. Cause I don't think that was the dynamic in the first place. They might just say, well, it worked. Okay. We don't need to go back to the other thing. And it might take a strong, football right association to get it back. And I don't, I don't really see that happening. Players don't necessarily want the media in the locker room, the physical going into the locker room after the game, you know, that doesn't really happen a lot in college. It does happen, but not as often. So there might be some changes that way, but I don't look at it like, you know, we're never going to get the access. We had the one-on-one -on -one and the, the ability to pull people aside and talk to them ever again, because I don't think that was taken away. Uh, by any for any reason that benefits the league and, and the you know whole media industrial complex as a whole. 
and, and the media companies, ESPN and, and different television networks fund the leagues in a way anyway. So if these television networks want more access and maybe that's why it's changed because the TV gets what they want at the podium and it's the writers and some of mm-hmm. the other uh, people in the media organizations that don't get what they want out of those interactions. TV's also getting one-on-ones uh, that we don't get after games, each team or the winning team. You know, you see Josh Allen talking one-on-one with, uh, with an ESPN reporter, Diana Rossini or Jeff Darlington. Uh, uh, I don't remember who the Patriots player was Monday night, but yeah, that's, you're getting all that's, that's exclusive contact uh, content in these days. That's, and that's at a premium when we don't have access to these guys, um, which really makes, makes it difficult for anybody to come up with something unique after a game. And, and that's uh, obviously makes us work harder. Um, but you know, we're all dealing with this identical material now, or I shouldn't say all of us. I think that's where I think really some of the sharper reporters uh, that that's why you want to make sure you read them after a game, because they'll find a way to come up with something that wasn't said at the news conference. But um Jerry, your take on uh, well, anything else you want to say about this, Jerry? Before no, no, I'm I'm a little fed up with it. Okay, I have a Tell question me. for Jerry because I want to ask him. Uh, I don't know if you call this a tough question. It might put you in a, a tough position, but you know, I think an important part of you being able to you asking the questions that you ask or a columnist asking the questions that, that he would ask in a post game press conference comes from being having the support of your editors and your employers and the people behind you that that's your job you're sent there to ask those questions and I'm just curious I know in different points in your career with different employers you have had that support and maybe not had as much support at different times and with different people backing you and how does that affect your process going into a press room after a game there were times when I didn't have as much support as I'd like but the Super Bowl years were Polian had the ear of our, our editors. Uh, there was that, there were actually times they held me back from practice because a player wanted to, you know, assault me. And I've had, I had things taken off my, out of my column once in a while, but it wasn't too bad. And then during the drought, I mean, they were so bad. It was like, it was, I guess it was harmless to have me taking shots. Um, I'm not sure what happened when I lost my column in 2018. No, Jonah, I'm not, I don't think I got a lot of support from, from management there, I think it had largely to do, I know it had largely to do with the uh, uh, the reactions of a lot of uh, Twitter people, I wouldn't call them trolls, they're not all trolls, that had, as they always do, a, an oversized voice online with a small time editor who was listening to them and decided that they should take me off the bills, whether they were outside influences uh, in town, powerful influences that were involved I don't know so I didn't feel a lot of uh, support there obviously at the end we had a lot of support at the Gazette as you do I think the Gazette and people at the Gazette were were proud that you were the one that asked those questions and wrote the column and uh, covered the game in the way that you did you know I'm I know at times I am have been guilty of provoking I thought that was my job at times. And I, as I said earlier, sometimes you get good stuff that way. The way I present myself, because I'm not a confident guy really with confrontation, if you could ask my wife, and I get tremulous and it almost sounds like, it, it almost sometimes creates more of an uneasy situation. I should be more like Bucky. He, I asked him, he, he said, I wanted to insult them. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I mean, think he, I mean he, he, he could go too. And, he, and I, I missed him in the room that time. I missed Tim wasn't there either, but, but Bucky didn't care. I think a lot of people misperceive that you do this for your own pleasure when, instead of a responsibility in your job or your role uh, in the Buffalo media. It's never been easy for me. As I said, I, I get nervous. And uh, I, a lot of times I felt, feel the question needs to be asked. A lot of times it does have to do with my column, like with the, with a Newton, uh, but no, I, I don't like being in the spotlight. That's why I wasn't as good of an athlete as a kid as I should have been. I could, didn't like people watching me. So yeah, I, I don't like being in those situations, but I always have felt an obligation. That's why I felt over the years, some resentment at the p- journalists who would never ask a tough question, who would never follow up when someone tried to intimidate me when there's a room of 50 people uh, because I felt it was my job. Um, and sometimes you go over the edge as I 
I don't know who I said it to once. But if you don't go over the edge sometime, you never know where it is, you know. You'll always come short of it. And sometimes do you, do you ask a question that sounds confrontational and pisses people off and makes them think you're not respectful? Sure. I, I once told Tom Donahoe, and I've said it since to other people, it was my job to be their biggest critic. That was my job. I was the one guy who was not supposed to think about their feelings and whether I'm respecting them. I was supposed to be critical of them. And that's being lost a little bit. We've got a president who ended press conferences, just ended them and talked about fake news. That's the culture we're in. I'm sensitive to that. It's only sports, but it trickles down. What was the question, if you remember, that you asked Bruce Smith when he got pretty angry with you at one point? It, was, it wasn't a <laughs> I wrote a column that criticized him for uh, – I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it might have been something like you know, talked to him, you'd think he was triple teamed all the time or, or something like that. It was critical. He was looking for me at a Monday night road game in Indy where I wasn't even there. I once, I later saw a film of him coming off the field with Scott Birchtall talking about where, where was I? So this was the next home game. So he was laying for me. So it wasn't anything I asked him at that point. I wasn't looking for a problem, but I wasn't going to run away. And he, he was there and he got in my face and I didn't, I didn't have a really good response that day. I, I did call him an a-hole. But I, I'm not as quick as I was when I was younger, you know, like, you know, good hands on the basketball court and stuff like that. But when I was 23, I wrote about a, a team in Binghamton that had been banned from the bars by the owner. It was brilliant. They were embarrassed. <laughs> they couldn't go in the bars because they were playing so poorly. I wrote it through a source, went in the locker room the next day because you had to go in the locker room. Dick Young said that. And the 6'4", 200-pound defenseman, 225, literally jacked me up against the wall. And into his locker, my, my feet were off the ground. And uh, he said, I ought to kick your ass. And I just didn't even blink. I said, be the first guy you hit all year. So he, he drops me. The room is roaring. One, there's a guy who was in that locker room who became one of the great GMs of the NHL named Kenny Holland. And it, was one of, it became one of his favorite stories. So I don't know. I'm rambling now. I thought we were going to be off this. But the, sometimes you wish you had the the perfect comeback. Rob Ray once asked me as I went into a, the visitor's locker room in Arizona one day on a road trip, he asked me uh, and was doing it to grandstand in front of the guys uh, and said, and, and bellowed, have you ever played the game? <laughs> and it was, uh, they, they, it was, uh, it was in between games. Uh, they'd played the night before. And I said, I played a minute and a half less than you did last night. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The room went nuts. And that was like, uh, that, that was the end of that. I mean, it was like, yeah, you got to be able to stick up for yourself. Um, but, you know, Rob and I have always had a great relationship before and after. I, I don't if if I had had a confrontational relationship with Rob before that, maybe I don't say it. But uh, we I'd been on the beat for a little bit. Uh, but the thing about your question, Jerry, I was stunned uh, to a certain degree as to how much ire it drew, because it was played as a clip and I didn't hear your question. I just saw their reaction. Mm -hmm. And so then I went and listened later and heard your question and thought that was the question that did it. And again, I had to reiterate, I know I've said it a bunch of times. Uh, people have been using that word all year. Mm -hmm. that, that was, that's a question that's been asked a lot. And um, I just think, uh, and people saying, well, how disrespectful it was. Well, then I guess we've been disrespectful all year. And these guys have been handling it because they've been agreeing that it's, it's been embarrassing. And I even wrote columns about that very early in the season, how refreshing it was that these guys are being their own harshest critics. It's not underdog mentality. You guys count us out, you know, coming off the field. You guys didn't pick us to win, which we used to get a lot of. Now it's, yeah, we should have won and we should have been better. And you're right. We do suck, you know, after the Steelers game or after the Jacksonville game. Maybe they want to be the ones that use the word. And you're right, Alan. You're right, Alan. Is he'll say it. He's he's very critical of himself, and he seems genuine about it. Um, and he hasn't he hasn't snapped at anyone. Sometimes you wish the guy a, a guy would you know you know how they always say. Well, I wish I wish they had more mean guys on the team. There has been some criticism behind the scenes that they need. They more, might have mean guys on the team, but we don't to talk to them. Yeah, they, they keep talk, no, they, they're mean to the media. <laughs> Not mean on the field. I would argue that. 
there was nothing really to be embarrassed about or, or that it wasn't an embarrassing performance by the Bills or the Bills defense. Maybe that's just debating semantics, but I think that, you know, if, you, if you're going to call it embarrassing or if a player should be embarrassed, it would be when you quit or the effort wasn't there or you really got blown off the field very, very badly. I think this was a game that uh, as bad as the Bills may have performed in certain ways and were overmatched, I think, from a roster and personnel standpoint in a lot of ways. They were also a couple plays away from winning the game. And as the game wore on, they did get better at stopping the run. And some of this, the Bills have had trouble stopping the run in a number of their losses this season against really good running teams. But they actually rank rather highly as a run defense overall and have played very good run defense against other opponents. Some of that comes from having the lead and teams throwing. But in terms of yards per carry and the per possession stats and things like that, the run defense is not that bad. So I don't know if only giving up one touchdown and two field goals in a game. Jonah, just stop. Man. It's they, something they to be embarrassed Five about. and a half yards of carry to a team that they knew was going to run every single play. There was nothing in, in the – It was embarrassing. In 40 years in the league. That was, it was embarrassing. I, think, embarrassing. I suppose. I mean, I think it was one embarrassing play early on where they gave up a long touchdown, and then oh. after that the yards per carry were – Three and a half yards. They, and it was they only gave eight I don't think they played runs. They gave up well. eight other 10 yard runs. Eight. Well, okay. All right. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But I wouldn't, I, if I was a player on the Bills defense, I would not have been embarrassed by the way they played. I would have been disappointed that we got beat, that the offense missed so many opportunities, and that the conditions and the things that happened in the game allowed the Patriots to steal a game when they didn't try to pass the ball. If the Bills would have came back and won that game, I think a lot of the reaction would have been that, you know, Bill Belichick overcoached and that not having a balanced offense yeah. and not being willing to throw the ball. Well, Bill Belichick wasn't going to run points. no matter what. He would have changed if the Bills ever forced him to. The Bills couldn't do it. They, the, the Patriots right. broke serve, and, uh, and then the Bills had to, all right, you fix it. We're just going to keep playing. We're gonna, in fact, I, I will say this. I think that very – Early on in that game, Bill Belichick decided the most important play was to run, obviously. I think his second most important play in that game was to punt. And then number three was to pass. And there to were times let, on third down where it's like, we don't care if we pick up this first down. He wasn't going to let the punt. rookie quarterback lose the game. I mean, they, it, I don't he, th they took the ball out of his hands, and he was good enough to not fumble the ball off his running back's chest one time. And they weren't going to let – They won six in a row with him passing that the win. ball. It, yeah, this was this, the wind. This was a weather game. This was a once in every few years weather event, and Bill Belichick played it perfectly. In that, I, was, I thought it was Tom Brady. He wouldn't have done that. You want to go back and look at my Twitter? I was it, you're right. Him not throwing the ball. He's at the twelve yard line, third and eight, and he can't throw a screen pass. I thought it was arrogance, and, and that's he's famous for that. I think he wanted to put it in McDermott's face, in Buffalo's face after that incident last year. We slams down the phone, and he wanted to make it up to them. Uh, and he was going to just do it his way. And it almost cost him the game. I do think that would have been what was written rightly. If they had lost the game, it would have been because he didn't try harder to score a touchdown when he was in the red zone at least one time. And he was just going to do it one way. And you can't tell me a guy who passes 70% of the time, the rookie of the year, can't complete a couple of passes. That It was astonishing. He won. So you, you can't criticize him. But I – he kept I deploying he that, uh, that offensive lose. line, extra offensive lineman, you know, blocking tight end, fullback, and the Bills kept going with their base defense. Well, the 4 3 defense, I should say. Right. The Bills never matched really up pickle. against that. And, and, and he's like, if they're not going to adjust, we're just going to keep doing this. But in the Bills, I stop. think, lack the run defenders and the front seven personnel to try to match up with that. I don't know what would have been. Some of that's due to injury. Some of it's due to AJ Klein uh, being inactive, and some of it's just the way the roster was constructed. They don't have the big bodies and the linebackers to put out there against the jumbo formation and try to stop that. Uh, but and as the game wore on, I think they did figure out a way to slow down the running game, but the offense wasn't scoring enough points, and it was maybe too little, too late because they didn't do that earlier in the game. So what's really on Hyde and Poirier's mind? You know, some some reporter it can't be that high in their in their mind. Did they, could they have been mad at their own coach for they, not adjusting? Maybe the or the like offense or, been, or the offense? Yeah, I think so. They were. Or you they could were upset you about could be something. 
if you're a defensive back, you could say, you know, maybe it's not my fault we can't stop the run. I don't know if that's what they were saying, but I could see that logic creeping into it. I do think, as you mentioned earlier, this goes back to the Colts loss. They were bristling at questions about the run defense after that game. And maybe for whatever reason, whether it's – Yeah, so where are some run defenders on this podium, right? Right. Maybe Let's get some run defenders up here. We shouldn't have to answer for the run defense, or we're tired of answering for the run defense because we already gave you – I mean, maybe if you read into it, that's what they're saying. We already answered these questions in the way we're going to answer because we're not going to throw anybody else under the bus, and you keep pushing. And I think maybe that's where Micah Hyde felt disrespected. That maybe he feels the media is pushing him to say something that, as a teammate, he does not want to say. And I don't think that's disrespect, but I can understand why it would anger a player to be put in that position. And maybe his anger is misdirected. Maybe it should be directed at his own team and the coaches and the PR staff for putting him in that situation. There's a lot going on there. And then when the coach comes out and starts criticizing, even in a veiled way, the offensive coordinator, this is a situation where they're probably lucky that reporters aren't in the locker room. Cause I think there's, I think the culture in there is, is a little cracked. I don't think it's as unified as Mr. Process wants people to believe. And he's it's probably, he's better off if he doesn't have people in there talking yeah. Isaiah McKenzie tweeting out damn after uh, after McDermott called him out I think people may be misconstruing that tweet though I, I people are saying that McKenzie learned that he couldn't be trusted uh by that quote it could just be why do you go out and tell everybody like mm-hmm. that could be his day da- I mean, Isaiah McKenzie tweets damn uh in response to McDermott's quote I, I think it might just be man can't we just keep that in house why do you have to tell the world that you don't trust yeah. him? But he's been subtweeting the Bills for a couple weeks now since he got benched. There, there's a whole underlying story there, I think, with Isaiah McKenzie and why he's not playing and, and the animosity between him and, you know, Sean McDermott, really. Just based on the tweets? Based on the tweets and based on the timing of his benching and based on – Well, it's a fumble. Uh, some of the things that McDermott has said – yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if the fumble is 100% of the reason why he's gotten benched or 100% of the reason why he seems to be on the outs with this team right now. But it does Boy, seem those. to be Sean McDermott's MO. He's done that with uh, Zach Moss. He did it with Matt Breda after the fumble on Monday night. He didn't see the field again. He's um, benched players for saying a little too much on Twitter and podcasts too. Yeah. It's taken, I think I, it's a combination it's of those It's taken things. one of the more creative – you know, tools out of Dable's box there because that stuff's been fairly successful the last two years. You know, the jet sweeps with, with McKenzie have often worked and maybe could have used a little of that the other night. All right, absolutely. R- different type of runs. They, they tried to run the ball in a certain way right up the middle and it never worked and they never really – and maybe they wanted to and, and they weren't able to because of the personnel was on the field, but they couldn't get anything going with – different types of runs, sweeps and end arounds and outside runs and running with the quarterback and different ways to attack the defense. They just never were able to do that in a game where you got to be able to run the ball because throwing the ball was difficult. Jerry, your thoughts on how this season turns out for the bills based on what we know right now. God, I see him going 10 and seven and being in a battle for a playoff spot. The thing is they've alternated wins and losses every week. And that means they win in Tampa, but much as I could not pick them against Belichick in that spot, and you couldn't either, I, I can't pick them against Tom Brady in this spot on the road. They've got a fairly easy schedule. Ten and seven is going to be a huge disappointment, but if they get in the playoffs, you never know. But Tim, I don't know if I, you know, I've been meaning to ask you this. You know what they're starting to remind me of? The 06 07 Sabres. Do you remember toward the end of that second season when they were expected to win? I think it was you and Vogel were saying at the bar once. They're not going to win. There was just something missing. So I think I see. They won the president's trophy. They were the best team in the league and uh, in the conference uh, final against Ottawa, they got destroyed. They were soft too. Their team the year before was better, much better. And uh, that's the team that lost all its defensemen and uh, was actually leading Carolina heading into uh, the third period of the Eastern conference finals. Somehow, some way Doug Janik scores a goal. Nathan Pace is, playing his first NHL game on the road. He had to pack a bag for an NHL game for the first time in his life. And it's game seven of the Eastern conference finals. Uh, anyways, that's, that's I'm digressing, but yeah, you're right. I want to digress 17. there though. Cause I, people, 
I like hearing you guys that cover that team talk about this season, especially as it relates to the contract negotiation with Drury and Briere. So are you saying that that team was flawed and doomed and wouldn't have won even if they handled that dynamic better? Because a lot of people will talk about how that was really what splintered the locker room and cause the team to underachieve. No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I don't think that, the, I don't think it splintered the locker room at all. I think that locker room was really tight. Uh, yeah, I that, think, that was the wrong word, but I think it, it hurt the spirit of the team and their leaders and their captains. Yeah. I mean, they were without a couple of players from the year before. Mike um, Greer. Greer McKee, I think was not on that team anymore. Uh, I don't, I don't. Okay. I, 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 sh- I wish I would have freshened up, uh, but um I think that the league had caught up a little bit coming out of that lockout. The Sabres just co- borderline coincidentally. I don't think Darcy Regeer knew exactly when he was gearing up prior to a lockout that the game was going to change as much as it did. I don't think he was any kind of visionary. He just happened to have the right team at the right time coming out of that lockout. And then teams had a full season and a full off season to adjust. And so the gap got, a lot smaller, even though the Sabres remained a great team when it comes to the playoffs, those margins get a lot thinner and uh, Ottawa just happened to have a, a better team uh, and had figured it out. Yeah. So they, they, they peaked early. And I, I think that might've been a little part of it. Seeing what happened with Greer, I knew rubbed Drury the wrong way, but my lasting image of that was Drury bleeding from his mouth after they were eliminated and basically saying we weren't tough enough. I don't think they were tough enough. Yeah, I recall talking to Daniel Briere off off the record, walking out of uh, uh, the Pepsi Center, it was known as the time, and uh, this was maybe two or three weeks before the playoffs were to begin, and he was concerned. He says that, that the team was acting as though there's a, a flip that you switch when the playoffs begin, and he was trying to get them to play playoff hockey then because you got to get ready for it, and he was concerned. He didn't think that they were of the right mindset, uh, you know, heading into the final weeks of the regular season. And uh, I don't know if that's the reason, but at least he, that he would know better than I would. Uh, and uh, he was, he was concerned about it. Oh, their power play. I, they didn't have um, Scott O'Neill behind the bench. Also the power play wasn't as good as the year. Before. Anyway. Um, and Ryan Miller could be an average goalie at times when you expected greatness. So not, not that that's why they lost, but he, he was never, he had his moments clearly, but other times he, he didn't, uh, he didn't pull them, pull them out of that type of thing. You know, I don't have any recollection and maybe because it was a fait accompli, uh, the senators had gotten off to such a great start in that series. Uh, even after the Sabres won the, their single game, I think that they won in that series. You just knew that they didn't have it. Um, I don't remember that final game. I remember vividly, being in the Carolina Hurricanes visitors locker room after that game seven, I don't remember that 07 team, um, that 06, 07 team in the final game. And that's generally the things you do remember about a season is when it comes to an end and, and that, but I don't know if that there's any significance to that or, uh, or not, but I think everybody even, even then was already thinking about free agency and, uh, and who they were going to be able to keep. Um, Okay. Hey. Jerry, thanks for this. Boy, an hour. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Good stuff. Jerry, well, you, thanks for coming on. We used to on. do a four hour radio show, three hour radio show. I think they used tough. to have bathroom breaks. It was tough. I had a lot of guests. All the guys who don't get on the other radio station, I'd put them on the air. <laughs> yeah, Myself a lot of included. breaks, a lot of coffee. Uh, Jerry, uh, before we go, have you ever been to Amherst Pizza and Ale House? I have. Mana. Right? You've gone. You've gone there to watch some Bonna games. No, I mean, isn't the owner named Bonna? Oh yeah, John Bonna. Oh yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking St. Bonaventure. John Bonna. Yeah, I have a story about everything. I had a column on his brother once. Gino. Gino won a contest. It was in a final eight of a NFL. You know, you did a, a commercial, and he made the finals. And I, I interviewed him, did a story. Uh, anyways, uh, Jerry. So Amherst Pizza and Ale House is a sponsor of Tim Graham and Friends. Uh, I just like to remind everybody that it's a place to go to watch all the college and pro football games and the hockey. They have ESPN plus. So uh, any of the games that are on there, you know, that you're going to be able to watch them. Amherst Pizza and Ale House is at 55 cross point parkway in Getzville. That's right off Millersport highway in the nine ninety. 
a ton of TVs. And when the weather allows uh, the patio, they have gas lamps out there. So uh, you can even go out there when, uh, when uh, now that we're into the winter. Uh, recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. Uh, and it's where Jonah Bronstein and I go uh, when we're done covering the games, uh, especially on Sunday, but uh, other days too. Uh, stop in or call for takeout and delivery. Awesome wings, awesome fingers, pizza. It has pizzas right there in the name. 716-625-7100. One more time. 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Uh, Jerry. Oh, Jerry, were you there, by the way? Me. Invite me. I come with John Gino Bonham, man. You got to get me over there. Did, oh, we're there did, every night. Just, didn't you do a Gronkowski up. story from I the did. draft? Thank you. Yeah, you Amherst Pizza and Ale House? I sat there for five hours that way for the entire draft even though we knew he'd be late and he wasn't drafted and, and the Gronkowski was supposed to come over. Well, then he wasn't drafted. I'm like, I don't have a story. I drive out of there. And five minutes later, Gordy calls and says, we're here. And I go all the way back and end up doing a story and talk to the brothers. So, but uh, yeah, that was Glenn Gronkowski. He ended up signing there. with the bills. That was Glenn, whatever his nickname was goose, I believe. Mm-hmm. Jerry, what's the more accomplished athletic family, the Gronkowski, the Gronkowskis or the Regans? The Regans? Whoa, I thought you were going to say the McDuffies. Um, you throw them in there. That's what's a good, that's good one. You have to go for NFL players. But I'll tell you what, there was some – Will wasn't the only great basketball player in that family. Larry's uh, – and Larry, of course. Didn't, two of his kids were really good besides Will. Kelly and, was a Mac player of the year, and, and yeah. Jim played at Damon and was very good. Yep. And now the only rowing gold medalist in the history of Western New York, and we've got quite a rowing club, Emily Reagan, who I think now is coaching somewhere in Boston. I have to drop her a line. Uh, now that I know her dad, who is very good to me, I watched the gold medal race with him in uh, Rio. It was a memorable day. And he would always fill me in what was going on. And uh, just, a, just a sweet guy. The, the, you know, the mother, too. The whole family was there. And... Uh, tough one i mean it's too many too many people are, are dropping but that's life could be me Jerry, next. take your vitamins yeah i'm gonna go lay down i got my uh, booster shot i'm gonna have a little reaction i think it's you though you take care of yourself of the three people on this podcast i think um <clears throat> vegas would have me as the as the favorite to be the next to go oh man that's that's cruel where can I get, where can I lay? It's all an algorithm, Jerry. There's no emotion when it comes to Vegas. It's all, it's yeah. all just numbers. We'll have to ask Joel about that later in the week. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's get out sometime. I'll see you at the, the, the ale house. Just let me know. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks. For, thanks for doing this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the listeners for listening to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK CPAs and business consultants. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. We'll